سخنان ارتش بود جورج کیسی فرمانده نیروهای آمریکا و اطلاف در عراق دخالت های رژیم ایران در عراق تعهد آمریکا برای حفاظت اشرفی ها تلویزیون عرافدین سه مه دو هزار و چهارده In 2004 to 2007 while I was commander there. Because I have seen firsthand how they operate and how they operate as a destabilizing force in the region. And it's been mentioned here that our country gave its word to protect the members of the MEK that were in Iraq. It was the American military that made that commitment for our country. And I will tell you, it galls me every day that I think about it, and I realize that we can't deliver on what we promised. And the American military likes to keep its word. If, if the nexus between terrorism, weapons of mass destruction, and regional instability is important, and cyber warfare is a significant threat, Iran is, is a negative factor in each one of those four. When, when I went into Iraq in the summer of, of 2004, uh, I knew Iran was going to be a significant player. Uh, they, they share a border uh, with Iraq. O over time, I came to see the Iranians employing a three-pronged uh, three approach. And, and, and I've seen it in, them do the same thing in other places. First. They work to gain political influence by providing financial support to political parties uh, and to political leaders. Uh, there was common cause here, and they have significant influence, and they gain significant influence in Iraq as, as a result of that. Secondly, they had a softer side. They, they, they burnished their image a bit by uh, in, in trying, trying to win Iraqi public support with economic assistance by providing economic assistance, particularly in the southern part of the country. Uh, and they did it directly themselves, uh, much like, uh, like, like we do sometimes with, with the Agency for Nation International Development, but they also did it through Iraqi political parties. And third and last, they fostered instability in Iraq through the training and equipping of, of terrorist organizations. And, and this is the one that had the most impact on me. And, and I came to see over time uh, a very close connection between the Quds Force, which is the extraterritorial arm of the uh, Revolutionary Guards, uh, and the Iraqi militias. And, and we got our first hint of this uh, really about 30 days after I got there. And as we were going back through our reviews, Lo and behold, we found intercepts from a Quds Force operative who was calling back and reporting on events uh, in Najaf directly to Quds Force headquarters in Iran. That piqued my curiosity, and, I, and we kept a very close eye on it for the rest of the time I was there. Where we really saw Iran's hand, though, was after the bombing of the Al-Askari Mosque in Samra, a, a northern city in Iraq, uh, in February of 2006. The Shia militia took to the streets, uh, and the more they operated, the more we operated against them, and the more weapons caches we found, and, and those weapons that we found clearly came from Iran. There was a particular, particularly lethal improvised explosive device, that needed a manufacturing tooling capability that didn't come from Iraq. It could only have come from Iran. Uh, there was a state-of-the-art rocket-propelled grenade that would penetrate the armor on our biggest tank. Uh, and the boxes we found with their ammunition were in Farsi. It was clear. And by the middle of 2006, there was no doubt that the Iranian regime was training and arming Iraqi militia and terrorist organization. No doubt. In fact, we had, we had such good data that 
before the Iraqi Prime Minister went for uh, had his first meeting with the Iranian Foreign Minister uh, days after he has, had assumed the position. And my intelligence officer and, I, officer and I went in and we briefed the Prime Minister on what was going on in the country, about the improvised explosive devices, about the weapons, about the training camps, and about the Quds Force presence. And Prime Minister, when I finished, Prime Minister Maliki turned around and looked at me and said, they are conducting terrorism in our country. And I said, yes, Prime Minister, they are. And it needs to stop. Another, later in 2006, we began to see a, a very troubling trend. And it appeared to us that Iraqi militia backed by the Iranians were actively pushing other Iraqis out of parts of Baghdad to expand their control over parts of the city. And we suspected this was going on, but we couldn't confirm it. Well, one December evening, right before Christmas, uh, our special operations forces captured six Quds Force operatives in what amounted to a command center with the Shia militia group, the Badr Corps. And, and the Badr Corps was the militia of one of the major Shia political parties. Uh, in this command center uh, were, were weapons receipts. They kept very detailed logs of all the weapons and equipment they got. And, and there was a map on the wall, a map of Baghdad. And it was color-coded. It was color-coded by sectarian group. And there were arrows showing the plan, which was to move basically the Sunni and the Christians out of parts of Baghdad so that they could be uh, occupied uh, by, by the Shia militias. This confirmed everything that we had been thinking, and it was immediately clear to me that the Iranian regime was direct, directly and purposely fomenting sectarian violence to destabilize Iraq. There was no doubt. So, so what, should I, what did I take from all this? Four things about the way Iran operates are crystal clear to me. One, the Iranian regime has and will continue to use terrorism to accomplish their political objectives. That's a given. Uh, secondly, the Iranian role in, in training and, and equipping the Iraqi militias was a major factor in sustaining sectarian violence uh, in Iraq from 2006 to 2008, and frankly, it continues today. And as I mentioned earlier, they're doing the same type of thing in Syria uh, and in Lebanon. Third, because of this direct role that they have, they are directly responsible for the deaths of hundreds of coalition forces and thousands of Iraqis. The Iranian regime is responsible. And so I conclude that they richly deserve uh, the label of state sponsor of terrorists, the terrorism that they have so well earned. I've come to believe that we can, we can count on this regime to continue to foster regional instability, and I'm not going out on a limb here because they're doing it today in Iraq and Syria and Lebanon. I believe that an Iran with nuclear weapons would present an un unacceptable threat not only to the region, but to the entire international community. And I can think of no other case in which organized democratic resistance against a regime is so warranted and so necessary. I'd like just to talk just for a minute about the MEK that's an important element of this resistance. I was in Iraq in 2004 when we granted them protected status. And over the almost three years I was there, we closely monitored uh, the behavior of the MEK at Camp Ashraf. I had two-star generals visiting Camp Ashraf weekly, and they would report to me weekly on what was going on there. Uh, I can tell you that we never had a problem, and the entire time I was there, the Camp Ashraf was very, very uneventful. And, and so I, I watched with dismay in 2009, in 2011, and in 2013 as the men and women that we vowed to protect were savagely attacked. 
and savagely attack after the United Nations, after the Iraqi government, and after the U.S. government had agreed that the MEK must be protected and resettled. We must ensure the, the protection of the MEK as long as they are in Iraq and until they're resettled. The MEK has consistently upheld their end of the bargain, and we owe them their safety and their future.